Life's not about the accumulation of things. That's what Jesus meant. When I arrive in this earth, I came with nothing. When I leave, I leave with nothing. You can accumulate all the gold, all the property, all the stocks, all the cars you want. But when you're done on this planet, it belongs to someone else. You leave with none of that. The only thing you step into heaven with are the souls that you got saved along the way. Hello again, dear friend, and welcome back. My name is Alan Bagg, and this is our Wisdom for Life broadcast. Today, we're going to carry on with our series, Being Rich Toward God. What does it mean to be rich toward God? What are the things that we need to be aware of if we want to be rich toward God? Jesus told us the parable of a man who landed up being called a fool because he was trying to hold on to too much. I want to change my heart. I want to be the man that's rich toward God. What does that mean? How do we put that into practice? We're having a look at that. Enjoy. I'll see you later. I remember when we were still back in Johannesburg, we were busy pastoring an area called Hillbrow. Anybody know Hillbrow? I'm talking about newer Hillbrow. And it was a challenge. You know, some people thought that when we went in there that the angels stayed outside and said, you guys are on your own in there. And Janine and I would often go in and go and minister. And I would lock my car. And then people would they say, you, you really go in with your car into Hellbrow and you're going to leave your car there? I said, I have no problem with that. Because I've got angels looking after the car. Now, if God didn't tell me to go there, I wouldn't do that. Are you with me? You use wisdom. There are certain places that I just don't go because I have no reason or unction to go there. But if God said go go. So I went on his instruction. And they said, but what if your car is stolen? My, my, this was my genuine reaction. Every time I walked away from the car, I said, angels, there's, this is your responsibility. I have responsibility there. Your responsibility is here. When I come back, I need to get home. And I would go quite confidently. Because in my heart, that if the car ever disappeared, all I would do is just phone somebody that I knew can come pick me up. I'd go home. And when I wake up the next morning, I would just wait for my next car to arrive. Because if God wants me to go back and visit some more members, I need a car to get there. And if there's no car, then God must not want me to visit today. But I think He does. So He'll get me a car. Are you getting? It's just total release into trusting God. It's not, not being arrogant. It's not been flipping about it. It's knowing where you stand in the kingdom of God. Right. And praise God, we never, ever lost our car. Amen. Why? Because of what I'm talking about. Amen. I didn't put my trust in the vehicle. My trust was in God. Amen. My trust was in Him. Amen. His protection. Amen. 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 Family, it's amazing when you see the kind of favor that comes on your life when those things happen. I, we, Jenny and I were going to uh, help a couple. We were busy doing marriage counseling. And so we arrived at their apartments, the flats, and there was a whole group outside. They were busy toy toying. There was something that they were upset about in the block of flats. And so Jenny and I arrived, and we kind of stood out <laughs> like we didn't belong there. And so. The guy leading that walked up to me, very aggressive, very angry. And he said, what are you doing here? I said, we've come to counsel one of our members. They're getting married. We're having pre-marriage counseling. He got even more angry because he said, they are supposed to be here in this uh, demonstration here. So I said, well, that's not possible because they had an appointment with me first. <laughs> so he went, oh. Okay, step back, let them through. And we walked straight through the middle of them to the elevator, went up, 
had the marriage counseling, and we were done. We came down. They were still busy. As the lips opened, he stepped, get them through, and all, off we went, and we got back in our car and went home. Amen. See, when you're seeking first the kingdom of God, Amen. heaven shows up Amen. to back you up and take you through whatever you need to do. Amen. See, the problem is when we're trying to do things and we're worried and concerned and we're panicking and we don't know what's happening, that's when we're on our own. You pick up the worry of something, then you've taken it out the hands of God. You leave it in the hands of God, He'll get you through it. Amen. Amen. Everyone say rich toward God. So yeah, He's telling us, don't trust in uncertain riches. Who must we trust in? The living God, listen to this now, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Why does God give us things? There it is, plain. You know, usually you ask people who don't know this scripture, why does God give us things? It's because He supplies all our need. No, that's part of it. God doesn't give you things because you need them. He does supply your need. But why? To enjoy it. The purpose, the reason He gives you things is to enjoy. Lift your hand and say, my God wants me to enjoy life. Now, that's a, that, that's a revolutionary thought for a lot of people. Particularly, you know, if someone's stuck in a religious, m traditional mindset, this is amazingly liberating and even feels like they're exposed sometimes. But I want you to renew your mind. Say it out loud. My God wants me to enjoy life. My God wants me to enjoy life. Is that the truth? Yes. There it is. It gives us richly all things to Enjoy. Now, now that we have all these things to enjoy, and we know we're rich, and we're trusting in God, not the stuff. We just enjoy the stuff. Verse 18, all the rich listening, do good. Be rich in good works. Ready to give. Willing to share. And what does that do? It stores up for yourself a good foundation for the time to come. That you may lay hold on eternal life. See, family, life's not about the accumulation of things. That's what Jesus meant. When I arrive in this earth, I came with nothing. When I leave, I leave with nothing. Can accumulate all the gold, all the property, all the stocks, all the cars you want. But when you're done on this planet, it belongs to someone else. Right. You leave with none of that. The only thing you step into heaven with are the souls that you got saved along the way. Right. Now, how do I get souls saved? By using things. Yep. Using things. In other words, we don't use people to get things. We use things to love people. Amen. So every time I use my finances to get someone saved, it stores a treasure in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. You getting this? Let's go and have a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Is this helping someone tonight? Verse 6. This I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, that just takes all the complication out of how I sow. It's not rocket science. This will explain my harvest, why some people seem to get more than others. Because it's quite simple. He who sows sparingly, reaps sparingly. If someone sows one corn seed, how many corn bushels can they expect? See, not rocket science. Real simple. Two corn seed equals how many bushels? Ah. 
So how do you think the person that sows a hundred corn seeds is going to have more corn than the one who sows five corn seeds? Is that obvious? So when the guy that's got a whole field full of corn, it all comes up, now that's a good harvest. And the guy in the backyard who's only got like 10 corn bushes can't look at the guy with a field full and feel envious. He doesn't get jealous. He can't get jealous. Hello? How come he's always got more? How come I want some of that? No. Plant more corn, you'll have more. The amount of corn you've got in your backyard was determined by how much you planted. And that's where the enemy has distracted people that it seems like those that have got a lot, they deserve it. They have to give it to me. That is not the script. That's not the kingdom of God. Are you with me? The rich owe me something. No one owes nobody anything except love. I said, no one owes anybody anything except love. That's what the Word of God says. So, when I see someone else doing really well, I don't think the solution is they should give me some of theirs. That's covetousness. The solution is reaping and sowing. I can look at someone else and be inspired by that. Instead of getting jealous Envious, critical. They're probably doing something illegal. They're probably stealing. They're probably... No. I look at that. If they have, then I say, you know what? I can do the same thing. And I learn. I'm not talking about people that are rich through corruption and that. I'm talking about men and women of God that are living godly lifestyles. And I say, you know what? That inspires me. I learn from that person. And I find out there's what the Word of God says. If I sow bountifully, I will reap bountifully. In other words, if I want a field full of corn, it's real simple. Find a good big field and put a field full of corn seeds in there. Put a seed in every piece of that land. Get as much corn out there as I can. You see, that's where a poverty mind says, oh, but I could have eaten some of that. Yeah, the problem is you eat your seed, it's gone. You sow your seed, it keeps multiplying. Say that. If I eat my seed, it's gone. If I sow my seed, it multiplies. That's why whenever I get something, if someone puts some money in my hand, I don't immediately go, oh, wow, I can go buy a new suit. Because that may be seed. God gives seed to the sower. So now I must determine. Is the seed or if it's harvest? God may say, no, I want you to have a new suit. Then I can go ahead and eat it. That's my harvest. But if he says, no, this is preparation for your next harvest, that is your seed. Now, if I eat it, I short circuit my next harvest. If I eat my seed, I schedule a time of lack. Hmm. That'll explain. Any time... That I am going through a time of lack. It proves I missed the time of sowing seed. If my field's empty, there's no seed in the ground. I know sometimes it's uncomfortable when we hear it the first time. But the thing is I can change my future. You see, I don't want to be blamed for the fact that I don't have anything today. This is someone else's fault. No, no. I, it was my ignorance. Either I didn't hear God or I did hear God and I ignored it. Amen? Yes. But that means I can change my future. I will never go through another time of lack. Now I settle it. I make sure that I'm always preparing my future. How? Through seed sowing. So that's why it says here, verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly of necessity for God, Loves a cheerful giver. Now, why would God love a cheerful giver? So God is now able to make all grace abound toward you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. 
How many want an abundance for every good work? That comes after everything else is met. Most Christians are still trying to get their needs met. This says all your needs are met, and you have extra for every good work. Every good work. Every good work. Not every work is good. What's a good work? Anything endorsed by the Father. Only the Father is good. Isn't that what Jesus said? Only the Father is good. So only what He has endorsed is good. Not my good ideas. His ideas are good. So now I'm enriched for every good work. It's written, He's dispersed abroad, He's given to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Now He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply the seed you've sown, will increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. Now the administration of this service, what service? The giving. Not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men and by their prayer for you who long for you because of their exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Now I want to read those same verses from 11 to 15 from the NIV because there's some points I'm going to pull out of here that will show you God's promises for someone that's rich towards God. How many want to be rich toward God? Now there are promises. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11 from the NIV. If we are cheerful givers, if we're sowing seed, rich toward God, the purpose is not gradual necessity, it's for good work. The preaching of the word, right? This is what will happen. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Why does God want you rich? So that you can be generous. Lift your hand and say, God wants me to be generous. Now, He doesn't want you to be generous so that you have less. God doesn't take from you. He wants us to be generous so he's going to make you rich so you can be generous. And if you're generous, he's going to keep you rich so that you can keep being generous. Are you getting a hold of this? Very often when people hear, oh, I've got to be generous. Oh, no, I'm going to land up with less. No, God wants to make you rich so you can be generous on every occasion. Now listen to this. Through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. See, whenever I tell a testimony, you heard me just now when I told about that young man who, who when the company said none of them can expect an increase, and then he stood in faith with me that he would receive. The company came back to him and said, he's the only one that received the increase in the whole company. What happened? Everybody erupted. And gave Jesus praise. It causes thanksgiving to God. It causes. Generosity causes thanksgiving to God. The service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it's also overflowing in many expression of thanks to God. So it doesn't just help someone. It causes glory to God. Because of the service by which you've proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. So our, we've got to go beyond our confession into action. And what happens? It causes praise to God. And for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, this is the people you're generous towards, in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. 
So here are seven things that will happen when someone is rich towards God. Number one, it causes a generous return. It causes a generous return. Number two, it causes God's grace to abound towards you. Everybody say abounding grace. Number three, the resources for your giving are increased. Not just for what you live out of. Your giving account increases. Hallelujah. Number four, it causes thanksgiving to God. Number five, Needs are met. All needs. Your needs and the person you gave to. Needs are met all around. Number six, it makes us grateful. We're grateful towards God. And number seven, God promises that others will pray for you. The Christmas season is upon us, and with it comes the opportunity to love on those very dear to us. It's a special time of the year that we can draw near to God and with our family and friends reflect on the reason for this Christmas season. The Bay Christian Family Church will be getting together on Christmas Eve to celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus. We encourage you to join us for this special time with family as we glorify Jesus through song and dance. For any information regarding the locations of the Bay Christian Family Church or their service times, please visit our website at allenbagministries.org. The new year is almost upon us, and with it brings a promise from God for the year ahead. Five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year! Join us at the Bay Christian Family Church as we see in the new year and receive a prophetic word from Apostle Alan Bagg about what the Lord has in mind for us in this year ahead. Receive it tonight. It's yours. It's yours. Take, it. Take it. Come on, give Jesus praise. Happy New Year. The service starts at 10 p.m. on the 31st of December, but we encourage you to get here early to ensure your seat. If you would like any more info, please contact Alan Bagg Ministries at any of these details. How many of you recognize that we are stewards of a God's kingdom. From the beginning of mankind, we were given the privilege of looking after God's kingdom. Although man lost that authority, Jesus got it back and once again put us in charge. I want to walk in it without being trapped in covetousness. And that tell, Jesus telling us the key is to be rich toward God. In this series, you'll discover how to be rich toward God. Because if my heart attitude towards wealth is wrong, then I'm not rich towards God. You will learn how to develop a healthy attitude toward wealth. When I'm rich towards God, I'll have a healthy attitude towards finance. You'll understand that God's desire for you is to increase in wealth. God's not against you having wealth. In fact, He encourages you to increase it. But He is very serious about our relationship towards wealth. Get this series and discover how to become rich toward God. You will see Jesus honoring your life with abundance because He has a purpose for it. Contact us at these details or visit us online. This is such an important message because we don't want to be trapped in the concept of being covetous. In fact, where Jesus even called the person a fool, the Word of God says that the prosperity of a fool will ruin him. And the way I make sure that that doesn't happen is by being rich toward God. I really want to encourage you to get a hold of the series. It's available on DVDs, on CDs, and on MP3s. You let us know. But make sure you get your set today so that you can listen to it again and again and again and develop your faith in that area. And so make sure you get it as soon as possible. Today I want to talk to the person that's watching right now. And you may be wondering if you're right with God or not. You're wondering if you're even born again, if you're a child of God. Somehow you came to this program, somehow you flipped to this channel, and you've been listening to me speaking. And you say, you know what, I want to know this Jesus. 
I want to know God. Well, friend, here's the good news. God loves you. No matter what you've done, He died for you. He gave His life for you. And then He rose from the dead. And today He's alive. And the Word says if you believe with your heart that Jesus is raised from the dead and confess with your mouth that He's Lord and Savior, you will be saved. So I want to lead you in that prayer right now. And I'm going to ask you to say this out loud with me. Right there while you're watching, just say this out loud that at least you can hear it. Say this with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me. You gave your life for me. And then you rose from the dead. And today you are alive. I believe that. Now I call you Lord. You're my Savior. And right now I'm born again. I'm a child of God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God, my friend. You're born again. You're a child of God now. I've got something I'd like to send you to help you with your new walk with Jesus. This is a CD, my Christian passport out of this world of failure into his kingdom of victory. This card is how to study through your Bible in a year. And then this one is going to explain to you what's just happened and some guidelines now that you're a Christian. That's our free gift to you. I want to send that to you free of charge. I'll even pay the postage. You just call us on that phone number or write to me at this address. And as soon as we got your details, we will send this off to you and you'll have it in a few days' time. Well, that's all we have time for today. We look forward to being together with you again tomorrow. This is Alan Bagg reminding you Jesus is Lord. Remember now, life is a choice. Choose life. God bless you. The Bay Christian Family Church is one church in many locations. With the help of technology and God's powerful grace at work, you can now fellowship with family at the Bay Christian Family Church at our many locations. Many locations, one church, one vision. It is one church, multiple locations. People connecting with people. Wherever you're able to connect. Alan Bag Ministries is making the series that featured as this week's Wisdom for Life programs available to you for purchase. If you missed any of this week's programs or if this week's Wisdom for Life programs have helped you, we encourage you to purchase the series featured on this week's Wisdom for Life programs and have them available to strengthen your faith when needed. It's alive.